Hi, this is the second overview video for chapter 5. In the last overview video, we went over the first four EGR sections of chapter 5, sections 1, 2, 3, and 4. And in section 5.4 is where we introduce the electric field. Electric field is a way to divide up the work. Specifically, it's a way to divide up the work between trying to figure out the combined effect of all the different sources that you may have in your system and actually calculating the force by having that combined effect act on the charge that you are trying to calculate force on. So this is the fundamental equation that defines electric field. If you are ever confused by what does electric field mean, this is what you should come back to. It's a surprisingly simple equation that many students underestimate how important it is. So we went over this last time. This is how electric field is defined and you can do it for point charges. And with the discrete charges, it could be a fairly tedious work, but it's doable. And you have some examples given in this section here. Now what we want to talk about is the calculation of electric field for continuous charge distribution. So this is what we mean by continuous charge distribution. We mean something like a long line of charge or we mean something like a large plane of charge or um, we could mean something arbitrarily shaped with some charge density. For each of these situations, we assign a charge density. Lambda is what we traditionally use for linear charge density. Sigma is what we use for surface charge density. And rho is what we use for volume charge density or what you more commonly know as density. So as I said, this is the more difficult part. This involves adding up contributions from little the charge element and it's going to involve integral and uh, I have a separate video that actually does the integral so I'll leave it that there. The textbook does have calculation examples for each of these so I highly encourage that you take a look at it as a sort of independent representation of what my recorded lecture video does. Let me leave you with this. The only thing that you are required to be able to do is something like this. Calculating electric field of a line segment or take it as a limit. Calculating electric field of an infinite line of charge or um, take it as a different example. Calculating electric field due to a ring of charge. As far as uh, calculations that require integration goes, that's uh, all that I would require you to know. And that's because when it comes to things like electric field of a disk, or um, what we might be more interested in, an infinitely large disk, you are going to learn a better way to do it. So if you watch my lecture videos, there will be an um, example where I do, do the calculations, brute force. I use a lot of Mathematica, but, but the main lesson in that is it's hard. So it is worth learning the method that you are going to learn in chapter six using Gauss's law. So that's uh, it for calculating electric field by integration. We want you to know how to do it for one dimensional cases. And if you can do one dimensional cases, great. You are going to learn how to calculate these without doing integrals. Well, without actually doing integrals, you will pretend to do an integral. All right, a couple topics remain in this chapter that's important. Electric field lines, it's important like a free body diagram in physics 4A. It's a hugely important tool of graphically representing what you know about an electrostatic setup. I want you to be very familiar with these pictures. Electric field lines of a monopole, electric field lines of a dipole and these are not just the pictures there are certain rules that they obey and it's uh, important to learn this 
because of God's law that we are going to introduce in chapter 6. They deal with electric flux and the intuition for electric flux comes most naturally from understanding of electric field lines. So please take a look at that. One last thing is the electric dipoles. I used to actually skip this in the past semesters. I realized recently that I need to cover it. And here's why I need to cover it. The description of electric dipole itself, I think it's easy enough for you to drive it yourself. You look at the force on the two charges and you can figure out, oh, there is a torque. And there are actually more things that I want to cover. The reason I want to cover electric dipoles is to use it as an analogy to magnetic dipole when you get to magnetism. The thing is, magnetism is going to be difficult, so we want as much usable analogies as possible when we get to magnetism. So we're actually going to cover electric dipoles after chapter 6, so that we'll have as many tools at our disposal as possible to do as many things as possible with electric dipoles. Until then, bye.